Okay, well, uh, Bob Schuckman is not only my neighbor, but a, um, an expert on, on what we're talking about here. He works for Michigan Tech Institute and uh, has done a lot of um, research on the lake. Well, that's great. Glad to hear that. So, Bob, were you a student at Michigan Tech, or did you just go, just begin working there as an employee? Well, uh, yeah, I'm really a uh, University of Michigan grad, all my five degrees. So, um, uh, we're part of Michigan Tech, but uh, we're a 60-person institute, Michigan Tech Research Institute in Ann Arbor, we're, we popped out of the university and were ERM and then we had various names. And then in, uh, um, yeah, I guess it was uh, 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 2006, that's when Michigan Tech wanted a Southeast Michigan presence and they acquired us. I'm the co-director here. Ah, so, I see. Shaggy dog story. Sorry, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Pat was on the Harbor Authority with me for a number of years, and he too has done a lot of uh, thought and research uh, about the problems in Cal Lake. So I thought he would be an ideal person to be on this group. Oh, uh, that's great. Well, in addition to that, um, I practiced in the area of uh, environmental law for several years. Yeah, that's right. I failed to mention that. Hey, everyone. Hey, Tim. How are you? Good. How are you? Very good. Very good. Mr. Mayor, or Ken? Yes. Um, Lauren Stanton has asked to join the meeting. If I allow her in, you'll have a quorum. It hasn't been advertised. We can't allow it. Hmm. I'm sorry about that. Obviously, we'd like to have anybody uh, who's interested. Um, well, you know, she, ha she ha has she been sworn in yet? Yes. Okay. I was, I was thinking if she hadn't been, then uh, we could get by on the technicality. Um, perhaps, perhaps I can let her in and keep her on mute so she can't contribute. Sure. Does that work? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Any unless anyone objects. No. I don't. No. 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 Did you explain? Karen, did you explain what we're doing and why? Pardon me? Did you tell uh, Lauren what we're doing and why in terms of her participation? No, I haven't I'll, yet. I'll do that, Karen. I'll take care of this garn. I'll right. take care of it. Okay. Everyone, sir, if you'd like to start. Go ahead. Uh, Karen, are you going to lead us through this? Uh, I was hoping that I could let you do that because I really know little about the subject. Um, my intent was to listen to the discussion, take notes, and in that way I can better prepare your next packet if I know what direction you want to go. But I don't think I can lead you there. Karen, do you want to make me a co-host? Uh, I can, sure. No, actually, it looks like I am a co-host. Why is it giving me that option? Well, I can do that if nobody objects. Um, uh, and then we can see how we carry on from here. Um, why don't we just go around the, the table here and have everybody introduce themselves briefly, because I, I don't think a lot of us know each other. Um, uh, Pat, you want to you begin? I could start off. Thank you, Ken. Uh, yes, I'm Pat Burroughs. Um, I'm a resident of the city of Saugatuck and have been since, we've had property in Saugatuck since uh, 1993, I think it is. 
I've uh, been down on the harbor now for about six years. I was a member of the um, Harbor Authority for five or six years. Um, prior to that, um, I had practiced environmental law and uh, have an undergrad from Michigan Tech and civil engineering. Yeah. Well, Bob, you're next. All right. Go Huskies. Yes, um, you bet. Yeah, I'm Bob Shuckman. I'm uh, a neighbor of uh, Ken's and Burnett's uh, uh, since 2009, um, right on the, uh, have a couple of boats. But more importantly, right now, I, um, I'm co-director of this Michigan Tech Research Institute. We do a lot of environmental and uh, water quality work and remote sensing and with uh, really uh, 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 Tower Marine, uh, we, we uh, ended up winning a uh, uh, DNR grant for approximately 75K now that has local donations from Douglas, City of Sugatuck and Sugatuck Township, Allegan County to uh, revisit the, the um, contaminated sediments and water quality in, uh, in really the entire harbor area, as well as do more bathymetry and some uh, hydrodynamic mapping. And along those lines, we're gonna release a, a website soon here. And part of that, and, and I'm gonna to get to how this is uh, helpful. We collected drone footage in July of the lake, and it clearly shows the extent of the aquatic nuisance algals there. And I'll make that available to this committee. Um, I can't go public yet till, frankly, I brief some of the uh, donors and sponsors on this thing. Great. Okay. And Garnett, our new Mayor Pro Tem. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Uh, Garnett Lewis, I think every, I know everyone except for Pat. Hi, Pat. It's nice to meet you. Uh, member of City Council and a resident here at East Shore. Um, and so I get to see our little uh, islands that begin to form always in the summer. So nice to be on board. Yep. Thank you. Tim? Hi, I'm Tim Straker. I've uh, been a resident of Saugatuck for about 10 years. I'm also on the Historic District Commission. Um, As chairman. Yes. And a uh, uh, boater at Singapore Yacht Club. Um, but aside from being a boater, I just, uh, I was interested in this committee just because I believe in the health of the harbor and its role in economic development and livelihood for the community. So um, the harbor is something I'm particularly passionate about. So I'm delighted to, to learn from you all and participate. Thanks. Scott, our newest member of the council. Uh, th thank you, Ken. Um, Scott Dean, um, officially a member of the council since being sworn in yesterday. Um, also, obviously, a resident of Saugatuck. Um, avid boater, uh, typically down at the city slips so when I'm lucky enough to get one. Uh, also an avid paddle boarder. And uh, my day job is with the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. Uh, I'm in the executive office there. My focus is um, on drinking water issues for the state. Um, but I, I do have a lot of familiarity with uh, the Water Resources Division folks that uh, tend to oversee the type of things we're discussing today. Great. Uh, and then there's Don Kellum. Dan Kellum, excuse me. Hey, everyone. This is Dan Kellum. I'm the Greenway Manager at the ODC Network. Uh, we've been doing some work kind of more broadly down in your area and saw this uh, meeting was happening today. Uh, ben Hirspink, our conservation manager, wasn't able to, to join, so I thought I would uh, just sit in and uh, hear what uh, you all have uh, going on and kind of what your, your strategy is going forward, if you don't mind. Okay, thanks. Um, Lauren Stanton is on, uh, but because of a technicality here that she would be the uh, 
fourth member of city council joining the meeting, thereby making it a quorum, thereby making it uh, to be legal, we would have had to publish this meeting beforehand and we did not think to do that. So we decided that uh, at least we'd give Lauren some exposure here um, by letting her um, uh, observe us as a non-participating observer, if that uh, makes sense. Um, so, hey, Lauren, we wish you could, uh, we could bring you in, but uh, next, we'll figure out a way to do that in the future. No so, problem. Publishing the meeting in advance. So, okay, and Aaron Wilkinson, our new uh, city clerk, is also on board here. Um, so I think we've, we've got one heck of a committee here. We've got a lot of expertise and quite a bit of experience with the problem. So I'm, I'm thrilled that I think we could maybe finally come to grips with this thing that's been dogging us for now three years, I think. We've been trying to get our arms around how we can improve the harbor, um, both uh, aesthetically and uh, from a standpoint of navigation. Uh, Karen has put together a, a great agenda and a, a great meeting packet uh, so why don't we dive into that unless anyone else wishes to make a comment. Okay, uh, the discussion documentation. Uh, first thing that uh, we included here was the uh, uh, study plan. And I hope everybody's had a chance to go through it. It's kind of like talking about our charge and our timetable. Um, uh, and uh, the makeup of the group. Um, does anyone wish to be brief further on this or have you all had a chance to take a look at it? Tim says, okay. Yep. I'm good. Okay, Darn's good. That's good. Okay. Um, so then um, we can, I think, go dive into discussing the, uh, what's listed here as the um, uh, DEQ Harrier email thread, which is very interesting. And to me, it's, uh, I've been observing this, as I said, for three years now. And so we've heard from a lot of experts, we've had studies done, and uh, the upshot of it is we have experts who recommend um, essentially doing many different things, three different things at least, and we have no consensus from those experts on, on what's the best way to proceed. Um, any uh, preliminary reactions to that uh, thread. What I was uh, thinking today was that uh, we could identify um, the issues. Uh, number one, I mean, they're all stated here in uh, the various mm -hmm. emails and uh, uh, have a discussion about the ones we want to pursue. Maybe we should uh, look at the Kaiser and Associates uh, study, which was done um, uh, now uh, two years ago, um, mm -hmm. which recommended that uh, we proceed with um, a herbicide treatment. Um, that that uh, study was reacted to by um, um, the ODC and a couple of other, others uh, questioning the, um, the effectiveness of that and the and the, the side consequences of uh, using herbicides in the lake. Um, and also the difficulties that we would have in terms of getting riparian uh, permission uh, to go that route. There were other suggestions that were made of essentially weed cutting using the lawnmower approach. And uh, that has also its own uh, problems associated with it, not the least of which are, are sending um, uh, frag fragments of the uh, milfoil downriver uh, to reroot. Um, although I'm not sure that that's a serious problem, given that uh, one of these studies say that milfoil won't grow in uh, more than four feet of water, um, and the, it's already taken root in the parts of the lake, at least on our side of the bridge, uh, that have less than four feet of water. So uh, it seems to me that if they get flushed downstream, they're going to end up out in Lake Michigan. Um, and then there was the idea that uh, uh, you send a diver down and you have the diver cut the milfoil and, and collect it so that you don't have any of the um, uh, threads of, of the milfoil drifting. And then finally, there was the idea that I thought was cool of um, trying to get down to that part of it. 
Um, The weevils, yeah, and uh, which which intrigued me. You unleash all these weevils that literally eat the milfoil, and uh, there was some um, uh, statement here that that it kind of works. The problem is we don't know that there's anyone who can provide that anymore because the company that did it um, doesn't offer that service at this point. Hey Ken. Yep. Ken. Can I ask a couple, to jump in. Can I ask a couple of foundational questions that are super, super basic and naive? Of course. Um, so after I read through all the material, um, I was left questioning. I, I get from the maps and things where plant material is growing from the bottom and um, and multiplying. What I don't understand is the difference between like is is cutting or or getting rid of that plant material, um, is 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 part of the problem. Is that's also catching things coming downstream. So it, what's the difference between sort of the confetti, what I call the confetti material, which I think is the duckweed, which is pervasive and a problem and coming downstream, versus the milfoil, which is the plant that's growing in shallow areas. And are those two things connected in terms of our problem? So. Um, and that's probably those two questions are separate from if we solve one or both, I realize from reading the material, there's still stuff that comes from upstream, but I don't have a sense in any of these mitigation efforts of from a, on a scale of one to 10, how does, how does doing it down here impact it overall, even though we might still see things coming downstream? That's, that's a very good question. And maybe Bob and, or Dan could uh, weigh in on that. Yeah, um, yeah, Bob Shuckman, um, I'd like to make two points. One, let me answer uh, that question. Uh, the duckweed is, you're right, and that's a nice analogy. Uh, I'll use it. Uh, the confetti that's on the surface, that has a separate algicide requirement where you literally use one of those sprayers and you spray it. The milfoil, Eurasian milfoil, is rooted and that algicide is in the form of pellets that you put into the water. They're negatively buoyant and they sit and they kill things at the bottom. Now, um, in the great summaries, incidentally, of, of the approaches, um, my institute, in particular, uh, a guy named Colin Brooks, that we can have brief you guys, part of his PhD, which he recently completed, was under a Great Lakes restoration initiative activity in the UP that evaluated diver, beetles, algicide, and crop cutting in respect to just the Eurasian milfoil. They don't have the duckweed problem. Again, solution of pollution is <laughs> dilution. The, the algicides, as Ken pointed out, were problematic and ended up spotty, the, the actually best remedy they found under that uh, EPA study in the UP was divers who cut and then had big suction machines that sucked the ripped up vegetation off the bottom and then they piled it up on shore their second most successful part of this evaluation was the um, using the blade that's about four feet under the water and literally cutting it. And, and that seemed to at least remedy the situation in a given vegetative season. But of course that would come back again. But um, I'll, I'll take the action 
uh, Ken to pull out Colin's report and I'll, I'll give it to your uh, managers to distribute to uh, this team. Again, UP, but UP Harbor area, really similar to what we have here in Segato. So we're talking about the stuff, um, mitigating the stuff that grows, not the stuff that floats. Correct. We're talking oh, about both. Yeah. Just this, okay, stuff that grows, got it. Yeah. Well, will the, will the duckweed, the stuff that floats, um, be a problem if we get rid of the milfoil? I mean, it seems to gather because of the milfoil. Right. <laughs> No, that's, that's a good point, Ken. I mean, if we had better circulation like we have had in the past, i.e. not the Eurasian milfoil that acts kind of, I think, as a collection uh, a device on the surface, I think the, the, the duckweed would flow out into Lake Michigan like it used to do you know, three, four years ago. So Bob, to that point, if if I'm walking along the boardwalk in downtown Saugatuck and there's a mass of milfoil and duckweed on top of it, sort of a foot or two down into slips and out in the water, is that because it's been cut upstream or is it becoming dislodged and coming downstream? Um, <laughs> I would hypothesize it got dislodged probably by frustrated boaters that, including me, full confession, that sometimes plow through that in my sailboat and, and it rips up and then it floats along with the current and then the duckweed, you know, attaches for a ride. Okay, thank you. And one of the problems that we're having with duckweed over on our side of the harbor is that it it gets caught up in the docks along the shore. Yeah. And and it isn't the it isn't the milfoil that's holding it up, I don't think. I think it's just that it it's not with the water being as high as it is now, uh, the uh, the duckweed just can't get away and it gets caught up in the docks and that's quite a problem. Um, so we um, we lived on a on inland lake, Lake Columbia, for a few years. And at Lake Columbia, we had this same problem, but not with the duckweed milfoil. We tried uh, harvesting it, and that was just an expensive uh, problem every year that we had. Uh, so we used, um, and they still are, using a chemical to treat uh, the lake with. Um, they're not having any problems with, uh, with the riparian owners on the lake and it seems to be keeping the, the weeds in that lake under control pretty well. I was uh, on that lake uh, this summer uh, talking with one of our friends there and uh, they used some kind of treatment that uh, cleaned the lake up and they said that it'll last for three years before they have to treat it again. So that's what, that's what I've learned about uh, what they're doing Pat, down there. Pat, could you get us the details on what algae side they used and in the company and all the particulars? Sure, I can do that. I'll, um, down here in Florida now, I can get a hold of uh, my friend up there and uh, through the, uh, they have a homeowners association. It's a private lake, by the way, Lake Columbia. And um, I think I can get that information through their homeowners association. What I think is fascinating about um, what you guys have said and what I'm, what I'm trying to seek to understand is, an outcome of this committee and what what we um, recommend or land on, even if I look at sort of Ken, where you opened with sort of the three different approaches that have been laid out is, you know, yes, in the docks, um, the duckweed and the milfoil clog up and, you know, it plugs up as a boater, it plugs up the air conditioning systems and the intakes and the strainers and it's awful. But as a, as a tourist, um, it's also on the beach in the cove. Um, and it makes certain parts of the harbor sort of unswimmable and unusable depending on which way the wind goes. So from the health of the harbor, from a overall enjoyment of our community, non-boater or boater, um, I, always, I wonder at the end of this, whatever solution we land on, kind of on that scale of zero, 
having no impact or 10 totally fixing the problem? Is it like getting a haircut, you know, once a month? Are you investing in something over time to get a four, a six, an eight, a two on that scale? Um, that's, that's the thought bubble above my head of kind of the work, I guess, I'm imagining we're going to go through and figuring out a solution. So I, this is Garn. I have a, a, a question. So I'm going to ask for Bob for clarification. You, you said something a little bit ago about the flow of the water was a bit stronger uh, several years ago. And instead of that, that um, duckweed or um, flowing into our little cove here that we've got, it would just continue on out to the lake. Is that, is that how I understand it? it used to be a stronger current or the flow was different? The, yeah, Garnet, good question. I mean, the, the hydrodynamics are complicated in, uh, in, in the lake. And, and that's why we have to be careful, uh, Pat, if an algae side works in an inland lake with not aggressive circulation, then the algae sides a lot of times will work better. We have a lot of flow and, and I measured the currents a couple of weeks ago, uh, Garnet, they, they're about the same that they were a few years back before we had the high water. But I think the issue is, be, and, and we know that in front of our places, because the docks are now literally at water level, they can't flow underneath them. So as the water comes through, you know, Blue Star, and part of it shags a right in front of our places, the, the, the docks, because they are in the water, are actually surface barriers. And that has decreased the cleaning out of the water in front of our area. Okay, so, uh, and I've got another question. There was also, um, when I read through this and then part of our initial discussion here is that a lot of this has to do with the depth of the lake. And so obviously in front of our place here, this that's a very shallow location as, as it seems our point number 46 and 47, I think it is on this from Kaiser Associates that we got. So I'm gonna ask a stupid question and I already know the answer, but is it a matter of dredging that, those portions to make it deeper? Is, and this, and apologize, I'm trying not to ask stupid questions, no, no, but this no. is what's in my head. I'm like, okay, no, can we make it deeper? My, yeah. It's an interesting thought. I mean, there, there is no stupid question, so, so that's fine. This Eurasian milfoil, and it gets a little complicated, guys, and, and sorry, and, and I don't want to dominate or be a geek here, but, but it's the depth of the water, quote, this Eurasian milfoil likes five feet or shallower water, though we have found it in seven feet of water. The rub here is water transparency. We measure that with a Secchi disc. And during the summer, when we got a lot of algae in the water, our Secchi disc, that is the transparency in the water, think about is about three feet. The rub here is in the spring when I measured it, and in the fall when I measured it two, three weeks ago, it was at six, seven feet. So if the light can get farther down into the water, then we can get this uh, milfoil taking hold in the sediment. And so it's a complicated question, but if we dredged, I would recommend you dredge to 10 feet because that for sure would would be deeper than than the quote published values of its its favorable depth habitat. So Garn, to, to pick up on your question, uh, I was sort of thinking the same thing. 
in a slightly different way, which is one of the reasons I'm interested in this is because of the health of the harbor. While the water is up, I don't think our depth is up. I mean, yes it is, but um, silting is still occurring. And I'm worried that when the water goes down, um, if this thing grows in a, in a shallow environment, as Bob just described, I'm worried that more of the harbor is going to be um, subject to this because um, it's not very deep out there in 107. Um, and even just, you know, using the depth finder on the boat at the beginning of the year versus the end of the year, um, silting is still happening. So I don't know what role that plays in the long-term health in terms of how we manage this, but that's the doorway I enter in terms of being concerned about um, making sure we kind of get after this problem. Yeah. Well, for all, sorry for all of us who knew and loved RJ, <laughs> we heard him say many times that this whole harbor was going to become a swamp if we didn't do something about it. So, um, and I'm sure we all heard him say this numerous times. Um, so it, it is a concern I think that we all have, any of us who have a boat and know that our, our lanes are, are becoming a little narrower. Um, yeah, yeah. No, you're, you're right, Garden. And, and the previous speaker is correct. I mean, if, if the depth finder I'm, on my boat is any indication, less, less than 10 feet depth is uh, quite widespread outside of some of the more established channels in the lake. So, the, so it's with the high water, uh, there's, a, there's a number of areas outside of 107 that are, uh, that are under 10 feet depth. Well, where does that leave us? Um, you know, I, I've been thinking that our charge is to d decide on the most optimal approach in terms of effectiveness uh, and then uh, do a cost analysis so we have a cost benefit ratio and then deal with the implementation issues such as riparian uh, permission and, and so on. So it seems to me, uh, unless somebody thinks a different direction is better, is that we should concentrate on um, evaluating and deciding what the best approach is first before we uh, move on to the other important issues. I agree. Um, one question on that front. Um, what was Douglas's experience um, last season? I, I, I understand they used herbicide. Is that their intent? You know if that's their intent next year and are there advantages or disadvantages to deviating or to uh, joining up with them and use a similar approach in terms of, you know, a holistic approach to, uh, to tackling this problem that's, that both communities face? Well, I, I think I can start um, re the response to that. Um, we discussed this at the Harbor Authority recently, and um, uh, Douglas did uh, use herbicide, and I, I think it was 20 acres or, or thereabouts, essentially in Wade's Bayou. And they thought it was quite effective. Um, I think they had two applications. The cost of the two were about $60,000. And they fully uh, uh, realized that they're going to have to repeat that again next year uh, to continue to be effective. And they did contact the contractor uh, that they used to make that application. And the contractor indicated that if Saugatuck were to uh, join in, that they'd give us a pretty significant discount uh, for both communities. And Douglas is, it would be very interested in having Saugatuck uh, uh, join in with their approach. That's good to hear. Um, I, I was gonna make one other uh, suggestion. And again, sorry, it's a academic hat here, but uh, we also ought to look at what they did in Port Sheldon. I know Ken and I boat up there and spend the evening and whatever they have done in the last year, they, they conquered again their Eurasian milfoil problem. You could get in there and anchor and, and it was fine. Um, and, and the Holland folks are doing things as well. So I think part of, as we formulate the plan, and, and I don't think it's gonna affect the schedule, I think we ought to find out what our neighbors have done, maybe even South Haven, 
and and just so that we can lessons learned and not repeat maybe a uh, wrong turn that could be costly. I, I think that's an excellent idea because I think that would be good messaging to have if we decide to go a particular route to let uh, the property owners around the lake understand that we're you know going to follow what you know hopefully will determine will determine as best practice among a number of communities in the area. So I think that's an excellent idea. Yeah, Bob, I, it was remarkable the difference of Fort Sheldon's uh, air, water area there between this year and last year. Last year, I had trouble, you know, just getting out of there because of the uh, density of the weeds. This year, there was hardly, there was nothing. <laughs> and same with anchoring. So the, the right. anchor actually went into the substrate, not on a weed bed. And yeah, it was. Yeah. Along, along those same lines, um, Lake Makatawa is, is uh, I don't go up there and boat up there. Do they have any of these issues? Or probably not because it's not a flow from an upriver location? Garnet, it, it was, I was in, we'll call them the back bayous, because that's where we like to moor a couple of times this year. And they did not have a weed problem. So I, sure. here, unfortunately, I don't know, and I can't recall whether they did have a weed problem. They may have been treating their weed problem for years, and and therefore I never had a problem. But I think we could make a a phone call and and figure that out right away as part of our fact finding. I think it would be, to Scott's point, I think it'd be interesting, uh, especially Grand Haven and South Haven, um, having voted in both places quite a bit this summer, it was pretty bad up there. Um, and it's, it would be both good to know what they've done to mitigate and if it's worked. And if they did something that didn't work, um, that would be an important part of our narrative, I think, in terms of where we end up. Um, and it would give people confidence that we like you guys said, reach out to our neighbors um, on both both sides of the equation on what worked and what didn't. This is Dan. I'm I'm not sure that Holland has had as significant a problem with the the milfoil. I know Ben has treated a, a couple small spots, but I really don't think it's been an issue. We've certainly had plenty of duckweed the past few years. But as, as far as I'm aware, the, at least for the, the conversations I've had with some of the, the folks up there, it's been, uh, can we get the docks high enough to be able to let everybody get their boats in? I, I don't think that's, that's been an issue to my knowledge, at, at least there. Okay. Yeah, I, I think another neighbor to contact would be, would be uh, Whitehall. We boated up there uh, this summer and the municipal marina was just, uh, packed full of duckweed and milfoil underneath it. It was horrible. I don't know if they didn't try to treat it at all, but it'd be interesting to see what, what if anything, they did try to do about it. Yeah. Another quick question. Sorry to digress a little bit. So help me understand what we're seeing. So when we have a bad storm come through and, and then if you're around down by retro boats or over along that way, you'll see, is it, is it the duckweed that's piling up or is it the milfoil that's been dislodged from it? What, what, is, what is it that ends up getting caught up on its way out, the, out to the big lake? All of the above? All of the above, Garnet. I, yeah, I, I, I see a combination piled up the whole summer, basically. It was it wasn't more. Sometimes it would only be duckweed, but most of the time it was the combination. Okay. And then one, one other question along those same lines. What I've noticed, especially towards the end of the summer when it's really quite warm, and I know we've had several residents complain about um, uh, the smell. So is that also a combination of the two, just kind of lodging in there in the docks? <laughs> 
Well, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I, I, I'm going to ask all these questions. We we docked in a in a in a massive field of duckweed in Whitehall, and it stunk. It, yeah. it, the smell was overwhelming. So it was probably at its worst right there. And maybe Bob, to your to your question or to Garner's question about like the area around retro boats or otherwise, again it that stuff that we're seeing in those areas around the harbor, are, are you able, or is anybody able to say, is that coming from these areas in Douglas and Saugatuck that we're looking at? What percentage of it do we know is coming in from being dislodged and run over in that area versus what percentage of it is building momentum coming um, further upstream? Well, that's another good question, and to be honest, I haven't tagged it, but but I, I would speculate right now that that is locally grown stuff, i.e. it came from 107 and, and in the shallower parts of, on the Douglas side, as well as ours, and, and it was there. I mean, we, we get a, a fair amount of volume exchange with with Lake Michigan and um, and and this stuff is really flowing out uh, so the stuff that gets stuck here I think is getting dislodged dislodged by boaters and getting dumped in quiescent parts of the water system here well while that's not good that's actually better in terms of investing in mitigation because at least we know if, if that is the case which I appreciate your perspective on that if that's the case then we're treating where the bulk of the problem is coming from because one of my concerns has always been especially if this if a solution ends up being we have to do it over and over and over if the bulk of the problem is still coming from upstream what impact does it have when we're doing something in our own backyard but if, if that's the case, we would be sol trying to solve the bulk of the problem that's happening in our backyard. Yeah, I'm, I'm not seeing, you know, I, I go quite a few miles up the river in my whaler uh, over the summer, and I did not see Eurasian milfoil up, up the river. I mean, they have water lilies and other issues but I did not see the Eurasian no-foil problem. I had no prop fouling up there at all. That's helpful, thank you. You know, the question of, um, you know, this not being a landlocked lake, uh, do, does this weigh toward herbicide being more or less effective compared to the cutting technology, given that we do have flow and upstream sources and even, even the lake flowing backwards from time to time? Does, does, would that, um, influence our thinking in any way? This is Pat. Um, I'd like to think that we might have a, a combined approach. I don't, let's, let's look at this from the standpoint that there may be more than one approach to the harbor. Maybe a combination of herbicides in low flow areas and cutting um, in high flow areas or something of that nature. So I, I'd like to Keep that um, as in the background. Sure. Well. So can we maybe the, uh, sorry, Ken, I'm, I'm, so a thought comes to my head right away. Maybe it is good for us to first hear back from Port Sheldon and, and, uh, and see what they did since obviously whatever it was they did has worked um, and see what maybe kind of best practices they've used up there that might be helpful for us here. Right. Uh, I agree. And, and some of these other neighbors as well. Um, Dan, does um, ODC have uh, information on any of those locations? You mentioned that you did some work in uh, how in uh, Lake Makatawa. Um, anywhere else? Might be on mute, Dan. Yeah, Dan, you might be on mute if you're responding. 
Uh, sorry, I just uh, stepped away for the, for a moment. What was the, the question? Sorry. Well, well the question is, um, um, the observation was made, of course, we want to check with our neighbors. Um, in addition to the work you did on Lake Makatawa, do you have any information on places like Fort Sheldon or Fort Sheldon or Grand Haven, South Haven, and so on? Uh, I'm not sure about South Haven. Um, I might, I've got a, a contact I could connect with in uh, Port Sheldon Township to, to at least see if they can uh, send me in the right direction of who might have done activity up there. Um, Grand Haven, I, I might have somebody, but uh, I, I don't have a real good contact up there. Well, Karen, Karen, could you connect with the city managers in these places and get some information maybe? Karen? There I go. Yes, I, I, I know Grand Haven really well, and I can find out who's in South Haven. That's not a problem at all. Okay. Um, so that's one uh, piece on our action item. Anything else any, that uh, you all would want to have us do before the next meeting and bringing back more information? Ken, is there, is there a critical milestone we need to hit? I know you laid out the timeline in the beginning and in our documents, but is there a critical milestone on seasonality? Are we missing anything this yet this fall that's important for next spring? I don't think so. All the reports that I've read, they're, you know, all the, the uh, cures were pretty immediate that you start in spring or you start when the milfoil is growing and, and do it there. My, my concern is that if we have um, work to do in implementation of this thing, that is uh, getting riparian permission, particularly, uh, also getting agreement amongst the city, citizens of, of Saugatuck about funding this stuff, uh, that's going to take some groundwork. And uh, so that's why we were pushing to have a recommendation from this committee to go to city council by early February. And, and Ken, to your point, if, if we do go the route where we want to partner with Douglas, we'd want to make sure we get that in so we can get that that uh, advantaged uh, price uh, if we go that route. So that's, yep. that's another deadline item. Yep. Okay. Any, anyone else have, have uh, comments here? So... Just to recap, I think we agreed that we need to concentrate on deciding the approach first uh, and then get to the cost analysis and implementation issues. And there'll be a list of those, like how we're gonna pay for it and uh, how we're gonna get permission from the owners. Um, and that our, our first uh, 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 task here will be to bring information back from our neighboring communities and do a little more research and uh, come back and meet, meet again. Sound good? That's great. We'll That's work good. with Dan and get some stuff on paper and call the other city managers and maybe they have some contacts even further that we can, we can call. I will do that. That'd be great. And anyone else on the committee here, if you, if you come upon research that's been done that would be helpful, please share that. Uh, through Karen, so it'd be great. Will do. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we had a great meeting. We decided that we'd meet every two weeks, uh, same time, same station. Um, so we'll uh, uh, meet again. I don't have the date in front of me, but two weeks from today. And this time, uh, we'll publish it as a as a public meeting so that anybody can join in. I will do that. So, so Ken, that's the day before Thanksgiving on the 25th that works for me but uh just duly noted so anybody have a problem with that no okay we'll stick to the schedule then thank you very much it's been a great meeting i think we're off to a good start we certainly have a good committee here thank you all right thank you. have a good day everybody bye-bye bye-bye thanks everyone bye